All right. Good to see everyone this morning. Sounds like everybody's in a good mood and ready to worship the Lord. It is good to see you today. I, I do want to take uh, just a moment, and uh, before we pray, we're going to uh, recognize some special guests. This is a, just a, one of the days we always look forward to here is when our uh, trustees are here. And so I want to take just a moment to introduce some special guests. If you're a trustee and you and your family, if you're here, I want you to stand uh, just a moment so we can recognize you as a trustee, all of our trustees. All right. Thank you for these folks. Students, I want you all to know that these folks love you. They love Clear Creek, and they're constantly asking me about you, and they're constantly praying for you. Uh, they're a part of churches that support you through the cooperative program, and uh, they're always focused on what they can do to be a help to Clear Creek. So I want you to know that, uh, that they, uh, they appreciate you so much. So uh, take time throughout the day as you see them over there at lunch and just uh, thank them for their support. Uh, I always look forward to their wisdom, their input as they uh, meet with us uh, twice a year. So uh, we're, we're thankful for our trustees being here today. We also have some other special guests. Uh, I think I want to recognize our auditors. Our auditors here are Brother Dan Campbell, Rachel McMichael, and Mark Hepner. You folks stand up. I want the, our folks to see them. Please welcome them to our campus this morning. Amen. I love these folks. They're a great group of people. They love Clear Creek, and uh, and they uh, they always help us work through our financials and our audit, and uh, do a good job in reporting to our trustees. So thank you all for being here today. It's good to see you. We also have Dr. Todd Gray, who is our executive director treasurer of the Kentucky Baptist Convention, and Dr. Michael Cable. Is did I pronounce that last name right? close enough. Uh, Dr. Gray and Dr. Cable, thank you all for being here. Good to see you all. We appreciate you all. And, uh, these folks are Clear Creek cheerleaders, and uh, they're always talking up Clear Creek wherever they go. Anytime I'm in a meeting with them, they're always thankful for Clear Creek and, and what Clear Creek means uh, to our Kentucky Baptist Convention. So thank you all for being here. It's good to have you here. Now let me take just a moment. Maybe you have a guest with you uh, that you want to introduce somebody I've missed this morning. Anybody? Okay. All right. Well, uh, before we pray, I want to do this. Uh, I always take this time during our trustee meeting. I want our trustees to see that uh, we have uh, people uh, who, who serve here, uh, employees, and I always like to recognize them. We have uh, different uh, terms of service that we recognize, and this year I have two folks that I want to uh, recognize, and this is a testament uh, to um, the, our folks that come here to serve. This is a calling. Not only as a student are you called here, but even this is not just a job. Uh, to folks who come here, uh, and I don't call it work, I call it serve. We get to serve here at Clear Creek because this is where God has called us. So I always like to take a moment and recognize uh, employees, and uh, we don't have a lot of turnover here because this is a calling, and God plants us here, and we're allowed to serve here. So this year I want to recognize two people. Uh, where's Miss, is Miss Cindy here? Cindy Sanders. Cindy, you come up here to the stage. Cindy, we're uh, recognizing her for 15 years of service today. She works in the financial aid uh, offices, and all of the students get to know her uh, because between her and Eddie Barker, uh, they're the ones that dish out all the money to the students, okay? <laughs> so, Cindy, you come up here. Thank you for your service. Oh, we appreciate you. All right. Okay. All right. All right. All right. All right. So, Cindy, we're recognizing her for 15 years of, of service a day, so that shows you there's longevity when folks come here to serve. And then our, our second one I want to recognize is Dr. Jay Sulfridge. Uh, Dr. Jay Sulfridge is our academic dean. Now, Dr. Sulfridge and I go way back. We started here about the same time. He started just a, a year or so after me. Uh, he served in different areas uh, of administration and faculty, and he served as our uh, academic dean for about six or seven years now, I think, and we're recognizing him for 20 years of service. So we're thank you. Thank you. So 
we're thankful for folks like this that are obedient to God's call to come here and serve. Uh, just like every student that comes here has to give evidence of God's call on their life, it's the same way when we hire somebody to serve here. We have to hear that testimony and know that this is where God has called them to serve. So as uh, we take, as they stay here with me, just a moment, we're going to pray. I want to thank the Lord for them. We're going to ask the Lord to bless our time of worship together today, and then the worship team is going to come and lead us in worship. And then after that, uh, my friend, Brother Bill Wright, uh, who is one of our trustees, is going to be preaching for us today, and I've been looking so forward to this. Brother Bill served as pastor of Main Street Baptist Church in Williamsburg, Kentucky, for I think you said 13, 14 years around there and transitioned from that season of ministry to uh, uh, family past, or minister to families or senior adults at First Baptist Church of Richmond, where one of our alumni, Travis uh, uh, Ferris, pastors. So uh, Brother Bill stays busy, and uh, we've asked him to come and preach for us today, so he's going to be bringing God's word to us today. Brother Bill, I love you, and I've been praying for you, and I look forward to hearing you uh, bring God's word to us today. Thank you for being here, okay? So, Father, we do love you. We thank you for this day. And, God, uh, I want to thank you for uh, Clear Creek. I want to thank you for placing your call upon the lives of uh, uh, Jay Suffrage, Cindy Sanders, all of our folks who serve here. Thank you for their commitment to serve here. And we recognize them today. And thank you for using them here at Clear Creek. Thank you for our time that we can gather today. Lord, thank you that we just uh, can come together and worship. We lift you up today. We pray for Brother Bill as he speaks your word to us today. And Lord, as we think about uh, all of the requests upon our hearts, we know uh, this is a season of Eliza Broadus offering. We lift that offering up to you. We pray for all of our missionaries who are serving. Lord, we just pray for them in all the situations they're facing today. May we continue to give through Eliza Broadus so our state mission uh, missionaries can have the funds that they need. And God, just bless our time together today. <clears throat> Speak to us through the worship. Speak to us through your word. And may you be glorified in all that we say and do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Well, Clear Creek and Clear Creek family trustees, let's stand together and worship our Savior. Ah! 
going to enter into our time of prayer. And so this morning, as the Spirit leads, sitting, standing, or coming to this altar, let us petition our Lord through prayer.
Sing with us. Who has held the ocean in his hands? Who has numbered every grain of sand? Kings and nations tremble. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we do come to you this day adoring you, 
God, we know that today is a day of significance here in the lives of Clear Creek. But God, we don't want to pass up this moment of acknowledging that our King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ, is on his throne yesterday, today, and forever. And God, because of that, we can rejoice, Lord, for the days ahead and the days yet to come. We thank you. And so, God, now as we end this time of worship through music and enter into worship through your word, let your word come on the speaker boldly and let us be attentive to your word this morning. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray this. Amen. When he said, I fought a good fight, I finished my course, I've kept the faith. Now, Dr. Fox is not finished. He's transitioning. But he has served in such a wonderful, amazing, impeccable way. He exemplifies Christian character, Christian gentleman, a Christian statesman, and God has blessed Clear Creek Baptist Bible College to have him and Miss Penny. And I'm going to ask them both to come to the platform. And I believe, and I know you believe this, that they deserve a good round of applause. And I would just say a standing ovation. Now, let me say this. The trustees are going to recommend some things on behalf of this sweet couple. I can't share that right now, but uh, I want to ask them to come. Dr. Fox, Miss Penny, would you stand with me? you're remaining standing, I want to ask Brother Wright to come and pray a very special prayer over him, over them, and then he's going to come with the word. Amen. Amen. You continue to pray for them throughout this day. Brother Wright. Thank you, Brother. Oh, Father, we do thank you for the day and for this institution and for the good leadership of Donnie Fox and Penny through many years in various capacities in these last 15 years as yes. president. Lord, we know that they will continue to serve in your kingdom and they'll continue in faithfulness to you. I pray that you'll guide them in the next phase of their service uh, as it takes shape. And under your guiding hand, Lord, make clear to them each step of the way. And I know, Lord, you're going to use them well. Yes. May we honor his legacy by continue, continuing to be faithful in this place and to serve you and to seek your guidance over everything that is done. Lord, we praise your name, and again, we just thank you for this fine couple and their family and pray your blessings and grace over them and their life. In Jesus' name we pray, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Well, bless you, Dr. Fox and Penny. We appreciate you. Good to see all of you today. Now, I want you to know that one of the first things I did when I came in was to find the clock because I know what comes after this lunch. And uh, so I'm going to honor that time. But I was blessed by the worship. And that last song was new to me. But I really appreciate that song. And uh, I don't know how many of you, maybe it was new to you as well, but man, that was, that was meat, has substance to it. And uh, pray, praise God for just the privilege of worship with you today. And of course, uh, I do want to reiterate what I just prayed. Thank you, Dr. Fox and Penny, for your faithful service through many years. Uh, you have done well. You have finished this part of your course well. And so I tip my hat to you figuratively. 
But I want to challenge all of us today to finish well. Now, I prayed for a good while about what to preach today because of the occasion. And I certainly want to acknowledge the fact that this is a time of significant transition. But I felt compelled to really go a little different direction today. And I, I, I had to go this direction. And I believe that Dr. Fox typifies, personifies what I'm going to talk about. And uh, when we think about being faithful and, and basically, quote, being successful in ministry, the question is, how do we measure ministry? How do we evaluate uh, the effectiveness of our ministry where we meet. Now, many of us are already in a place of service in a local church or somewhere else and have perhaps served the Lord in some capacity for many years. But for many of you today, you're on the, the, the front edge of that and you're, you're either preparing to enter or are currently in minister position and you are here to be trained for that. And I kind of want to talk to you today in particular. Uh, I'm now in my 71st year and I'm at that point in life where I really want to uh, share some things. And so uh, I'll just invite the rest of you to listen in. But I want to ask the question, how are you going to measure your ministry? Um, I have with me this, this tool and you'll recognize it. It's, it's a tape measure. And with this tool, we measure uh, length. Now, you certainly wouldn't use scales to measure length because that measures something else. But this is a tool to use if you want to measure length. Now, we measure perhaps as parents the growth of our children, or we may measure uh, something else. But most of the time we're using this tool to measure the length of wood or some other material that we're using in construction. Now, can you imagine sometime some of my uh, projects, it looks like I haven't used a tape measure, though I have. You know, the old saying, measure twice and cut once, and I've learned that the hard way. But can you imagine trying to build a structure without using a standard of measure, a tape measure? Can you, can you imagine, or, or using it incorrectly, or using it infrequently and, and just occasionally, what would it look like? You know, the structure you build would not fulfill its purpose. It wouldn't stand well. It would be out of square and just would be, as it were, a disaster. You see, what you use as a measure is important. And the same is true in ministry. So, what's a measure of ministry? Well, I want to Turn today to Jesus' words, always a good place to turn, and we're going to look at Luke chapter 10. Now, when Jesus was preparing the, His disciples for the day that He would send back to the Father and send the Spirit and work through them, uh, they've, they've always had Him around, and so He's preparing them continually. And you will note in the Gospels that Jesus taught them, and then He showed them and then he worked alongside them, and then he sent them out on mission, in, in, in training missions, so to speak. And so in Luke 9, we find him sending out the 12 on mission to prepare them for the day that he would send them uh, with the Spirit's power, but he would not be with them. And then after that, in chapter 10, we find him send out the 70. And he sends them somewhat as an advanced team to go where he is going to go. Now, I want to commend this chapter to you, uh, any but, but students. If you're looking for a manifesto of ministry, this chapter uh, is at the top of the list. Now, of course, you can turn many places in the Bible to get guidance from ministry. Paul's letters in particular, his pastoral epistles, or John, or Peter, or many other places. But I don't know that you'll find a more comprehensive and concise guidance for ministry than right here in this 10th chapter. Because as he prepares to send them out, uh, he talks with them about prayer and the potential of the harvest. And he talks to them about what to do when they face difficulty or to, to live on faith and minister in faith and just to take what they need and others will provide beyond that. Or he talks about when to stay and when to go. And that certainly is important. He also talks about the priority, the, the kingdom of God, and that's the message and what they're about. And then he talks about their authority for going, that it's in his power and his authority that he's sending them, and that's true with us as well. So he sends those 70 out, and then they return. And look at what we hear in verse 17 and following of chapter 10 of Luke. Would you stand with me 
It's on the screen or you'll have your own copy of the Scriptures. And uh, as I read, beginning with verse 17. The seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all power of the enemy, and nothing will injure you. Nevertheless, nevertheless, I do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. At that very time he rejoiced greatly in the Holy Spirit. He said, I praise you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants, spiritual infants. Yes, Father, for this way was, was well pleasing in your sight. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Turning to the disciples, he said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see things that you see. For I say to you that, the, that many prophets and kings wished to see the things which you see and did not see them, and to hear the things which you hear and did not hear them. And a lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, Well, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How does it read to you? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You've answered correctly. Go do this and you will live. Father, help us to hear what you're saying to us, each and every one today from this, your word. It's inspired, it's preserved for our benefit and illuminate to our understanding. And we will be obedient servants. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you and please be seated. Well, what we notice here is the joy of the disciples. They came back excited. They had experienced marvelous things, miracles. They had seen demons cast out. They experienced people he being healed and they preached the kingdom message. And people came into the kingdom and they were, of course, excited and joyful. We can understand that. You know, I can imagine, and, and we're not told this, but I just know among 70 people that were sent out on mission, and the master wasn't going to be with them, that some of them or many of them went out with some hesitation and trepidation, fear perhaps, nervous. Any of you ever gone out on assignment for the Lord with some hesitation, with some fear, Heart pounding, hands clammy, you know, going to the door or having the having an appointment coming to see you that you know is not going to be easy, and you kind of hope that nobody's home or they don't show up. <laughs> We've all been there. Maybe in particular, if you go to a new place or overseas or somewhere, or even right where you are. So we can understand if they went out feeling that way, that when they saw what God did through them and it turned out even better than they expected, that they were barely touching the ground, that they were relieved and they, were, they had the joy of having been obedient. You know, it really is, is, you know, if you want to find God, get out on the edge of where you're comfortable. Even step across that line and get into a place where you're not comfortable and sometimes that's where God shows up the most mightily. And he did here. And of course they were filled with joy. But what was the basis of their joy? That's what we need to pause and think about having heard what Jesus would say in a moment. The basis of the joy was the results that they, they experienced they measure success by the results they experienced. And again, that's not altogether wrong, but Jesus tells us there's something much more abiding than that. You see, Jesus' joy, we're told very clearly, was in the relationship with the Father and what the Father was revealing to the disciples and to others through Him. And He talked about the joy of a relationship with God based on love and faith in Jesus Christ. And that was Jesus' joy and so Jesus said something here that is shocking 
to us. It had to mean somewhat baffling to them when he said, yeah, this is good what you experienced, what you saw, but nevertheless, that's not your place of joy. That's not the measure of your effectiveness necessarily. You know, this is kind of counterintuitive to us. It sure is to me sometime. Now, we need to recognize the fact that Jesus wasn't saying results aren't important. They are. Anything that's alive is going to produce results. So, you know, where there's no results, there's death. And so that's not at all what Jesus is saying. But what he is telling us here is that the results are a product of something more fundamental. You see, results might be misleading sometime. Or, students, results will not sustain you in the season when the results aren't as visible as you might like. And those times will come. If you put all of your eggs in that basket, it, it just it won't sustain you throughout your ministry. You won't finish well. But also, using the measure of ministry solely by results uh, can lead to pride. And that is deadly. We've seen many a person do well at the beginning and then get filled with pride and, and fail. Kind of like the woodpecker I heard of that, that flew on a tree, light, uh, lit there, and began doing his work, peck, peck, pecking away. He didn't notice. He was so busy. He didn't notice a storm moved over. And the storm blew over, and suddenly a streak of lightning split the sky and hit the tree and exploded that tree into a thousand pieces and knocked the little woodpecker on his back on the ground and stunned him. And when he came to himself, he ruffled his feathers. He got up and he looked at that splintered stump that's left there, and he said, Wow, look what I did. <laughs> Be careful that we never forget that we don't do it. You know, when you think about results, my mind went to, uh, to Jonah. We've been studying Jonah the last couple of weeks in Lifeway curriculum. Some of us have. And Jonah's an interesting character. I call him the running prophet, uh, the relenting prophet, the reluctant prophet, and then the resentful prophet. And here's a man that, that never was really in his heart completely on board with what God was doing. He, I call it relenting because he went, but he really didn't repent, uh, as I understand it. And, and by the end of the book, he, he resents the fact that God spared uh, the city. And yet, as we have it recorded, he preached a one-sentence sermon. Maybe you wish I did that today. But he preached a one-sentence sermon, and the largest city of the world, of the day, New York City of their day, repented from the palace to the peasant. And throughout society was changing. God withheld his hand of judgment on those hundreds of thousands of people that were there with a man who really wasn't on board with it. You see, you can't measure necessarily your ministry by the results. Many a person has been in a hard place and has wondered, Lord, what's going on? And they've labored hard and haven't seen the results they expected to see, but God's put them there. And if you depend on the results, you can't stay long. <laughs> you know what uh, Jesus said, uh, that God could use the rocks to praise Him if He needed to. I'm not a lot better than a rock in that way. You know, it, it reminds me of Matthew 7, Sermon on the Mount at the end of it where Jesus said in the day of judgment there would be people who point to all the visible results and we preached and we cast out demons and all this and Jesus will say, not good enough because I never knew you. You know, after 40 years of ministry, I can give you personal testimony to the reality of the temptation to evaluate, to measure our ministry by the visible results that is experienced let me suggest three inaccurate measures that we sometimes turn to. And again, we all can be guilty of this. The first and probably most common is size. It could be any number of types of size. It could be the number of people that hear us preach or uh, the size of the buildings or the facilities or budget or anything else. You know, the mon uh, mantra of America is bigger is better. But is faithfulness tied to size. Again, sometimes God blesses and size is there and it's a work of God. But folks, students, I remember being where you are and thinking, uh, I'm going to go out and conquer the world. 
And it's, a, it's okay if you feel that way. I don't know if you do, but it's good if you feel that way. It's okay. But sometime, size is not better. You know, Judson labored on the mission field for years before he saw his first convert, and he paid a high price. I remember some years ago being in a South Asian uh, country where that was predominantly Muslim. And we gathered for worship in an apartment with just our mission team and two missionary families, and we had worship. Pretty small, small number, uh, but they were being faithful to the Lord, and the Lord was honored by that. The second inaccurate measure sometime that we may f adopt is what I call celebrity. What I mean by that, you know, we're in a celebrity culture. And what I mean by that is how many people do we know and how many people know who we are? That could be on a denominational level, SBC level, or the larger church or on a national level. And there are some who do have min national ministries and bless them if God has done that and put them there. But the number of people that know your name is not an accurate measure of your ministry. God may give you one of those ministries, but I would hasten to add that that's a dangerous place to be. It can really be our undoing if we seek. I, really, I think that to, for a pastor or a servant, a minister of any kind, to seek celebrity, that's an oxymoron. Uh, we're called, the very word ministry means servant. But then one more, and, and I name these because sometimes I guess they've run through my mind, uh, the inaccurate measure of opinion, the opinion of people. How many of you want people to like you? I'm right there with you. Of course, we want people to like us and to think well of us. But, you know, Jesus said, be aware when all people speak well of you. You know, to please people is, is a trap. And uh, let me ask you this. Did Jesus always please people? No. <clears throat> Did Jesus always love people? Yes. See, learn the difference between pleasing people and loving people. Because sometimes the most loving thing you can do is to displease them. I hate to, you may already know this, and I'm sorry to have to tell you this, but there will come a time when you will have to choose between pleasing some person that may be important to you and pleasing the Lord and standing for truth. And you'll have to decide where you're going to stand and whose opinion matters more. And, you know, people's opinion is pretty fickle, isn't it? Anyway, think about Paul and Lystra. Uh, one hour they were wanting to call him a god, and just hours later they were stoning him and leaving him for death. You know, people's opinion about as fickle as a teenager's romance. And uh, so be careful about that. So what is the final ultimate measure of ministry? Jesus tells us right there and gives us the example. It's not about results, but it's about a relationship. And it's out of the relationship when it's healthy that the results come. But don't depend on anything other than in your relationship with the Lord for your joy in ministry, for your fulfillment in ministry, for the measure of your ministry. Our relationship with Him is what matters. When Jesus was asked what is the greatest command as we read it, and Jesus affirmed the, the lawyer's answer was what? To love God with all of your being and then to love your neighbor as yourself. He says, and the Bible says that over and over and over again from Deuteronomy to the very end of the Bible, it is repeated that the greatest the core of life and the greatest thing is to love God with all that you have and all of your being and then out of that to love the people around you for Him and in His name and in His love. That's what really matters. Your love for the Lord and your love for people because of your love for the Lord and not the other way around. 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. Uh, you know, Paul gives us there that description of love. But do you remember how that starts? He said, though you may speak with the tongues of men and angels, and though you may have all kinds of prophecy and may give your body to be burned and give everything that you have, 
If it's not done out of love, then what does it amount to, he says? Nothing. Nothing. No matter how well you, and, 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 and students, no matter how well you minister where you are, the reality is somebody can do it better. I remember asking the Lord, Lord, what can I add this church? What can I, what can I do to serve this church? I mean, other people preach better than I do, without question. You know, other people can lead better than me. Other people can give pastoral care better than I can. And no matter what you do, there's always somebody in the world that could probably do it better than you could do it. But you know what I decided? And you know what you can do? There's only one thing that you can give the people you serve and give the Lord that nobody else can. Yourself in love with Jesus. And that what you do comes out of that love. Uh, nobody else can do that for you. I decided, you know, there cannot be another Bill Wright that loves Jesus other than me. And wherever you go and wherever you serve, that is the best thing you can offer the Lord in that place. The core of ministry is about relationship. But, you know, how do we do that? Let me give you four real quickly, four disciplines that will help us maintain that. First is, of course, your personal time with the Lord in the, in, in, every day with Bible reading and prayer. Don't ever neglect that. That's the priority of everything in your life. Secondly is exalting Jesus Christ as Lord, being like John. He must increase, I must decrease. That will align our lives. Thirdly, the discipline of obscurity. You know, sometime, I want to challenge you, sometime do something for the Lord and others that nobody else will ever know about. That'll adjust your attitude real quickly. Don't let everybody know. You know. Do you know how hard it is to do something good and then go home and not tell your wife or your family? But it's healthy for us. And fourthly, be intentional about celebrating others' success. You know, when someone in your class here down the road gets some position or accolades or something that you don't, your temptation might be to say, well, Lord, I never got anything like that. But you know, that's up to the Lord. And just intentionally say, I will rejoice with those that rejoice. And I will give thanks for that one being um, acknowledged and encouraged. So those four things will help keep us on track. But then let me put it this way. Your call to ministry is not your identity. Your identity is as a child of God through Jesus Christ. And your ministry is the way you express your identity. Amen. And that's important. Very important. There's, and I want you to notice as I close what Jesus says there. Something very significant. He says, don't rejoice in what you experienced and the results you saw, but nevertheless rejoice that your names are written where? In heaven. Now, I love that because first, the word written is a perfect tense, which means your name has been written, is written, and will be written. And the word written there means inscribed, and here's the way I like to paraphrase it, engraved. So think of it this way. Your, Jesus was saying, if you belong to Christ, your name has been engraved, is engraved, and will be engraved in heaven. He knows you. Regardless of who else knows you or does not know you, you may be known far and wide or you may be known by just a handful of people, but it doesn't matter because God knows you and has you in his hand if you'll trust in him. When our son Christopher came to us by way of adoption as an infant, three-week-old infant, uh, I remember clearly to this day uh, sitting down in our bedroom that night, first night, with him in my arms in a rocking chair. Couldn't do that today, he's 6'3". <laughs> but uh, I held him in my arms, and I made a promise to him. I said to him, and looked in his face, that little infant face, and I said, I'm your father, and you're my son. You will always be my son. Wherever you go, You'll be my son. Whatever you do, I may not agree with you, but whatever you do, you will still be my son. 
You will always be my son. That is my promise, and that will never change. And 29 years later after that day, he's still my son, and I'm still his father and always will be as long as the Lord gives me breath. But you know the best thing? The heavenly Father has taken us in in his arms through Jesus, the elder brother. And he has said to you and to me, you are my son, my daughter. And you always will be my son and my daughter. And wherever you may go, you're my child. Whatever you may do, you're my child. I will be your father and you are my son or my daughter wherever you go. Oh, listen, students, and I'll finish with this. After the ministry is complete, after the facilities crumble, after the crowds are gone, after your skills have left you, and they will someday, you will still have your relationship with God in salvation in Jesus Christ. And that's what matters. God bless you, students. I love you. The Lord loves you. And I hope that... You'll look at this text. You may not remember a word I've said, but I hope you'll take this text and meditate on it, saturate your life on it and your ministry. Let's pray. Would you stand as we pray? Oh, Father, thank you for your love for us and your faithfulness and grace and mercy in Jesus Christ. Never let us forget that the measure of ministry, the measure of all of our life is our relationship with you and our security in you and our love for you through Jesus Christ, the infinite Lord and Savior. Praise be to your name. Keep us faithful and help us remember whose we are. In Jesus' name we depart. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Just uh, one word real quick on behalf of the trustees, Brother Benny Bush. Ask that if anyone who uh, is available about 215, 230-ish wants to gather uh, in the cafeteria at Kelly Hall uh, when they're done with their deliberation and uh, are ready to announce the approval affirmation of the candidate today, then they will welcome you to come upstairs and join them in praying over uh, that individual. So I know there's afternoon classes. If you do not have class, if your class can let out a little bit early, 215, 230-ish, uh, somewhere in there, uh, they'll send word down and those who can and are there can come up and be a part of that. All right, thank you. God bless you.